Hey, so welcome back to Blood, Sweat, and Steel. Uh, welcome back to the Forge. I'm Chris. You probably know that by now. Um, I'm probably going to put this up on my Instagram as well, just to share it. Um, I wasn't going to make a video today, but my mind was changed by a YouTuber that goes by Lee Scottish Lass on YouTube. And she posted in her community tab, which YouTube hasn't seen fit to give me access to. I guess I'm too small potatoes, whatever. <coughs> and I'm not going to redo this recording because I've done it like six times. So. If I fuck up, I fuck up. Um, you know, we just got last posted in her community tab about what she was doing 20 years ago today, how she found out and what happened. But I kind of changed my mind about not doing a video today. I tend to stay out of doing this kind of thing. It's not where I want my channel to go, but this is a little different. And if a young woman from Scotland cares enough about my country to share her story of how she found out and what she was doing and you know how that made her feel and, and share her heartfelt emotions and compassion that she felt towards the city of New York the least I can do is honor the lives lost in New York by telling my side of the story and where I was, what I was doing, and what I would continue to be doing for quite some time after 9-11, after we found out. Um, so. The time is approximately 1300 hours Alaskan daylight time. Location Coast Guard Cutter Alex Haley, somewhere in the Bering Sea. Um, and the date was September 11th, 2001. Pretty much everybody that was around them probably knows exactly where they were and what they were doing that day. I'm no exception. We were doing standard search and rescue and law enforcement patrols out of the back in the Bering Sea. And I had just gotten out of basic training and been assigned to the Alex Haley about 11 months prior to that. So I'd been on the ship almost a year. And I was still the FNG, or the <clears throat> new guy. But I'd been on the ship long enough to kind of know how it feels getting my I had my sea legs and and I'd kind of gotten into the swing of things but I was a low rank and I was a non rate which is entry level and I was assigned to the engineering division department um, I had received some training for welding and to be a damage controlman and damage controlmen are the welders and ship fitters of the Coast Guard. They do all the structural repairs and welding and, you know, that appealed to me because you know why it appealed to me. I didn't know why at the time. I thought myself to still be a Christian and I didn't know that I would eventually become pagan. I had no idea. So, but I do now. Back then that wasn't a thought. I just kind of I liked working with fire, and that's all I knew. 
and being a DC let me use the uh, tools and equipment of a welder which allowed me to do that and this is the first time I've been away from home for this long my entire life I hadn't seen my family in over a year and I was, you know, I was adapting and I was adjusting it was fine and uh you know, doing the routine thing, I kind of gotten used to the, to the to the way things go. You know, you wake up, you report to your to your shop, your your assigned duty station. You get your assignment for the day. You go do your work, and for me, that included welding, cutting, phrasing, um, fixing things. The machine that the mechanics broke, <laughs> um, breaking things that the mechanics fixed. So it, it kept each other employed, you know, it was job security for both of us. And, uh, I felt the, uh, I was out on a fan tail when calm-ish, it was the Bering Sea, so calm is relative. But for the Bering Sea, it was calm. And I felt the boat lean hard to one side, which I'd know by then was meant we were turning, but we were turning really hard. And nobody said anything about it. So I assumed that we got a distress call from a vessel that was somehow managed to break something or start taking on water, or we had to go help them, or whatever. You know, that was interesting but not surprising at the time i just assumed that you know maybe we got the call or something else right but changing course wasn't horribly uncommon i didn't think anything of it round 1300 ish um, it was calling over the, uh, over the ship's loudspeaker system being, we're going to the port of Valdez, Alaska. Okay, whatever. No big deal. I mean, you know, we all got paid the same anyway, so what's the difference? But, you know, we were out there, say, maybe somebody's gotten hurt or needed assistance. What? Well, fine. Cool. You know, the Alex Haley wasn't a fast ship, but it was strong. Um, it was a handed down from the Navy. It used to be a Navy salvage vessel. So not speed, but pulling power. It was a, it was a big white tugboat. So... Okay, well, I mean, they were fine. Sure. We're going to Valdez. And they told us why and where it happened. And it took a while for that to sink in. They were going to Valdez. Exxon Valdez, Exxon Mobil, has a refinery in Valdez, Alaska. In fact, ages ago, there was a major oil spill there, and that was big news and it was a problem so that's why Exxon Valdez is you know kind of known about but not super well known I never heard of it until then and the reason we were going there it was a refinery for um, Exxon Mobil uh, liquefied natural gas and the concern was well we don't want that to come under attack because the amount of you know, natural gas and other explosive chemicals there had we there the thought was that they had the potential to eliminate the town of Valdez. Well, hindsight twenty twenty, the terrorists couldn't have found Valdez on the map if they'd wanted to. It was a postage stamp, and I don't think many people around the world would find it on a map. You might, if you look hard enough, but if you don't know it's there, you'll never see it. 
but we were on the opposite side of the continent from where the problem was. And Valdez is responsible for a large portion of our of petroleum fuel, a significant percentage in the U.S. So we had to go and secure that border. The problem was operational security was a high importance at the time. I'm not telling you anything now that you couldn't Google. Okay, I was a peon. I was a nobody in the Coast Guard. They weren't going to tell me anything special. And I don't know anything special because even during my entire time in the Coast Guard, I was the welder. They don't tell me things that, they don't, that I don't need to know, and I don't need to know much. Weld that. Okay, that's what I need to know. Cut that. Okay. Cut a hole in it. Fine. I don't need to know much beyond that. So, I don't have information that I shouldn't be telling you. So, I'm not worried about making this video. Um, for those that want to cry about it and go, oh, you're telling people things that you shouldn't know. I don't know things that sh people shouldn't know. Engineer. I, I, I fix stuff. I don't pilot the boat. I don't navigate. I didn't do any of that. I just welded things. So we go to Valdez, we find out it's September 11th, but late. Um, most of the world was already in a panic. New York was going insane by the time I found out. And rightfully so, shit had just hit the fan in a big way. And it took me a while to process it. It took a couple of days to figure it out what the old, how I felt about it. I didn't know. I was like, okay, well, we still have a job to do, so let's go do it. And a lot of us on the boat just took that mindset. Okay, let's get the job done. What else do you do? So, we get the report, and we're not allowed to contact our families. We're allowed one phone call tell them that we're okay, and then find out if they're okay. Your family, friends, loved ones think that, that but we can't tell them where, they, where we are, where we're going, or what we're doing. None of that. Not allowed to tell them that. At the time, it was, you know, not allowed to tell them. Now, it doesn't matter. But, you know, I was one of the lowest ranking people on the boat, so I was one of the last people that got a chance to make a phone call. When I got the chance to make a phone call, no answer. Okay, well, that wasn't uncommon. We didn't really have cell phones were a thing, and I had one, but they weren't what they are now. The best we had was like a kind of a bullshit brick flip phone. Smartphones were not a thing. Cell phones were, but they were flip phones and not terribly great. So, okay, and so I had to put my cell phone back, turn it off, take the battery out, put it away. Fine, all right. I left a message, said, I'm okay, can't say anything more than that, but I'm okay. I kind of assumed that they would know that because I'm not anywhere near New York. They knew that I was assigned to, you know, Alaska. They didn't know where I was or what I was doing at any given time because I'm not allowed to tell them that. I'd gotten used to that routine. And so had my family for the most part. <laughs> so we got to the town in Valdez and we were security. And we were security for a good couple of months. And we were for a long while not allowed to really contact family. September, by the end of September, 
we were, we were allowed to go into town and make the phone call, use a landline, use a payphone, whatever. And I actually had to call using the payphone because the cell phones didn't get any service in fucking Valdez, Alaska. So I had to use a payphone. There's people who are too young to know what a payphone is now. Which makes me feel old. Um, but one of the last pay phones in the country was in Valdez, Alaska. Even in 2001, yeah, 2001, pay phones still existed. They just weren't very common. Now, you're lucky if you ever see one. And it's, it's probably, it's probably in a museum. But I used the town's faith pay phone. Finally got a hold of family, mom, dad, you know, aunts, uncles, everybody's okay. But this was weeks later. This was the end of September. So, I waited a good three weeks before I knew if anybody was okay. And my family is from New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. Everybody I know and love is from New Jersey. New Jersey shares a border with New York City. The state border. It's just across the Delaware Bay. Uh, Staten Island is slap in the middle of New York Harbor and New York between New York and New Jersey. So I didn't know, and I had family that I think I had family that worked in New York. I didn't know where they were, you know, nurses, but they weren't in New York at the time, and everybody was okay. Which was a big relief to me. And uh, we were there for a couple of months. In fact, we spent Thanksgiving there. And securing the port, doing security patrols, and spending the entire time on very high alert and armed. I, I enlisted in the Coast Guard. Coast Guard is a search and rescue and law enforcement branch of the military. It's the smallest branch of the military. It's also the most undermanned, underfunded, and underappreciated branch in the in, in the military. Now, at the time before September 11, 2001, it fell under the Department of of Department of Transportation. It was not Department of Homeland Security until after 9-11. I was in the Coast Guard during that transition, and the Coast Guard changed. But that happened sometime later. <sighs> See, so, we spent a lot of time around Valdez. Not a whole lot of time in it. We had to provide security for the port and there wasn't a single vessel, ship, boat, civilian vessel that went in or out of that port that didn't have a locked and loaded Coast Guard weapon trained on it. Well, that's not true. We weren't pointing guns at them. But we were armed and we were ready to respond if need be. We weren't pointing guns at every boat that went by but we were watching them like a hawk and we were ready to respond if need be. And we were watching every aircraft that went near it. And most of it was bush pilots that had got some out of permission and it wasn't very many. Um, Alaskan bush pilots are a brig of our own. And they came to Thanksgiving. And we spent Thanksgiving in the port of Valdez, in, at the port of Valdez. And we were allowed to finally take some shore leave in Valdez, moored the ship up at the port there. And we were granted permission to accept the invitation to the Thanksgiving dinner that the residents of Valdez had set up for had set up and put together 
in the airport. And when I say airport, you have to understand this is not the kind of airport that we're probably used to. Okay, it's not big. And it is the Valdez Airport Car Care and Tire Center. And what they call airplanes weren't much more than a ceiling fan duct taped to a lawn chair with a board on it. Bush pilots are in a breed of their own. They are some of the ballsiest some bitches you'll ever see. Because they fly these things they call airplanes, which are not qualified for the term. Some of them are nice, but only the Valdez kind of weren't at the time. But that was the best Thanksgiving dinner I've ever remember I ever remember having. The residents of Valdez, they knew why we why we were there. They weren't stupid. They put two and two together. And they showed their appreciation. That is the first time, and actually the only time during my time in the Coast Guard where I actually felt like what I was doing was being appreciated by people. Well, the Coast Guard is the butt of a lot of jokes in the military. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't get nearly the respect that it deserves. And I'm not a part of it anymore. I got out in 2007. But it's a part of my history. Something I'm proud of having done. I wouldn't do it again, but I'm glad I did it. Um, but the people of Valdez made me feel like, like that's, that's the first time and only time where I remember feeling like I, my branch of service is appreciated. They knew why we were there. A very welcoming and uh, grateful host while we were there and we left we were relieved by the next cutter to come along and do security there just didn't continue much longer after that but they we got relieved and we went back to doing our normal thing my last night there uh, standing on the fantail again the very rear of the boat outside and I looked up at the night sky and the northern lights just exploded across the sky, across the black night sky that the way I've never seen before. And that was the first time I've ever really seen them seen them. And it's actually the only time I've ever really seen them seen them. And it was the most fantastic display of nature being weird that I've ever seen. Before or since, and uh, that was the first time I ever really seen the Northern Lights. Uh, it was my last day in Valdez, and I don't think there's any type of spiritual significance to that, other than it was cool. But it stuck in my head as as like marking us leaving and finally being able to go to back to what I had signed up for. Well, that was what I had signed up for, but what I had been used to during the first year, it was also the last time I'd ever feel really appreciated as a Coastie. Um, people say thank you, sure, but people say thank you when you hold the door open for them too. Um, and we never saw one news report there. Never got any requests for even one one interview. None of us. No, nobody aboard that boat. 
or any other boat that I know of. You know, the, the news was more interesting than you are. And it should have been. As, as that's, that's, you know, makes perfect sense and rightfully so. The, you know, the first responders and firefighters and nurses and doctors of New York, they, they, they showed grit that day. And they, they showed the world what New York, is, New York is made of. And it's made of some pretty stern shit. Pretty tough stuff. So, I'm not upset that the Coast Guard isn't, what the Coast Guard did on the West Coast isn't known by anybody. Why would it be? We're not here. We were kind of wasting time, money, and resources doing what we did because no attack came. Like I said, the terrorists wouldn't have been able to find it on a map if they wanted to. It was perfectly safe, but we didn't know that at the time. The higher ups were taking precautions. So, that's where I was, what I was doing. But part of me feels guilty about that. Like, there's Coast Guard stations on the East Coast that responded to it and helped evacuate. There's firefighters that lost their lives. There's doctors and nurses that lost their lives. There's police officers that lost their lives. They live in New York. There's families in New York who have empty, empty spots at Thanksgiving dinner to this day because of what happened there. And I didn't lose anybody. I'm not complaining about that. <coughs> but I signed up for the Coast Guard to save lives. And I was on the wrong side of the continent to do it. And I've always felt a little bit of guilt about that, but at the same time, If I'd been on the East Coast and something had happened on the West Coast, I'd feel the same way. It's just a matter of where you are. I'm not mad that I wasn't there. I'm kind of grateful I wasn't there because that meant that I didn't have to put myself at risk. But at the same time, that feeds into a lot of guilt. I wanted to do something, but I didn't want to do something. I don't know if that makes any sense. You know, I was on a boat and there was a big land mass in the way. We weren't going to get there in time to do anything useful, so we did what we could while we were on the left, where we were, or where we were at. But I know that day cost a lot of people more than it ever would have me. Pissed off as I am at my government and the bullshit that's been going on with it lately. It's still my country. Fucked up as it is, it's still my country. New York showed how tough they were that day. I wish I could have been there to help them out. But that's not where I was. Anyway, uh, you know, I ended up leaving the Coast Guard in 2007 because it changed. Like I said, um, it transitioned from the Department of Transportation to the Department of Homeland Security. And while that was beneficial to the Coast Guard overall, it changed a lot of things that I quite literally didn't sign up for. And had I known ahead of time, I might have signed up for it anyway, but I wasn't prepared for it. And I decided in 2007, when my time was up, that I would, you know, complete my obligation to the service and accept an honorable discharge and so I served my my required time and then some um, 
Well, September 11th is the event that changed the Coast Guard. Fundamentally, what like how it functions and how it operates. So that's that's my story of September 11th, 2001. I don't know if that. I don't know if my story does New York justice or not. Probably not. It had nothing to do with New York. I wasn't there. I was about as not there as you can be and still be on American soil. Well, American water. So. But. And 20 years later, the only thing I can do to honor the loss and, and the people left without family family members is to to honor that by telling my story and where I was and what I was doing just like a lot of people are doing now around this country and around the world help people in Scotland are doing it are, are sharing where they were and you know what they remember and most people tend to remember quite a lot about you know, this day 20 years ago. And uh, hearing We Scottish Lasses' story, well, hearing it, I read it on her tab, but still reading about her experiences, about like the fact that someone in Scotland cared enough to put that out there. Yeah, that changed my mind. And uh, that's made me reconsider just not making videos about it. So, Tammy, thank you. It meant a lot. To anybody around the world who's sharing their story of where they were and, and you know, what their thoughts and feelings were when they found out. From one American vet, thank you. It's it's appreciated. I know it's everybody's got a different experience. And this was mine. Thank you. And till next time, I'll see you in the forge. Bye.